Dr. David Jenkins, he, he should be famous. He, he's not as famous as he should be because he is, in fact, the man who developed the glycemic index, which lies at the heart of just about every popular diet known to man right now. You've heard of them, the Atkins diet, the Zone, the South Beach, the Sugar Busters, and the GI, to name but a few. But in David Jenkins' hands, diet is not just about weight loss, it is also medicine, and it is also public policy. Dr. Jenkins turned vegetarian when he was 13, when his mother tried to serve him his pet chicken for dinner. <laughs> How do you know all the details of my private life? Am I meant to stand here? I mean, I, can, I, or can I stand here? Can I? Can I stand where I am? Thank you. Uh, I, I, I bear you tidings of, of good cheer on the one hand and a warning for the future. And I can't be nearly as optimistic, I'm, I'm afraid, as our last speaker. Um, <clears throat> so um, can I just uh, quickly go through? I have lots of conflicts of interest. You'll find uh, we always put these things on in science. These are all the people, all the, all the all institutions who've helped fund our research over the over the last 35 to 40 years. If you see any that aren't on the list, please let me know, because <laughs> I want to approach them and add them later, um, which I will. Um, that's it. So can I take you back almost to the beginning, 20 million years ago? <laughs> About 20 million years ago, um, we, we, started, we started off um, basically as fairly primitive creatures, um, ape-like creatures, and we then split into these particular cousins. Well, I'll call them cousins. You may not want to own them in your family. The gibbons, the orangutans, the gorillas, and the chimpanzees, and then ourselves. Interestingly, their diets, if you look at them, are, for the most part, except perhaps with some of the chimpanzees, largely plant-based, high-fiber, um, and a lot of vegetable proteins. That's the diet. Homo sapiens is the one, is the, as it were, the odd man out. Um, he's the one who developed uh, stone weapons, instruments that processed our food, fire, and then the supermarket. So um, <laughs> really a very big difference in terms of what we eat, if you think of it, for what your guts were probably designed through evolution. In other words, we've had no evolution much over the period when we've had uh, stone implements and fire to cook our food. So um, we thought it would be a good idea to take groups, a group of healthy volunteers and put them on diets that could have come from various parts of our evolution. So, uh, what we did was we took basically a therapeutic diet, the sort that we're using in the hospital clinic, a Stone Age diet from the, uh, the new Stone Age, the beginning of agriculture. So this was a low-fat therapeutic diet. This was a low-saturated fat diet with a lot of whole grains, fruit and vegetables. And then we went back into the deep past, um, what we call the Simeon diet, uh, 63 servings of fruit and vegetables and nuts, in other words, back to the very basic diet. And we, we, we kept people on these diets, we prepared all the food for them, gave them all the food for two-week periods, then rotated them onto the next diet. So they went through all three diets. What do you think happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened. <laughs> this is what happened. The LDL cholesterol, which is our big mark of a heart disease, on the therapeutic diet in the two weeks fell about sort of um, 5 to 10 percent, quite nice. The, interestingly, the uh, early agricultural diet down to about 20, 25 percent. But then the deep, deep diet, the primitive diet, 35 percent reduction in two weeks. Are any of you taking a statin? Hands up anyone who takes a statin. Nobody, because you're all too fit on. But many people who are in their older parts of life, people of my age, are taking a statin. 
The reason we're doing that is because our diets are different from the original diet. If we were on the original diet, we wouldn't have needed a statin. So I think one of the lessons that we learned was that diet can be in combination as powerful as drugs in many ways. And that, I think, uh, started one off on a very different path in terms of one's research. So what was this diet? It required one to eat five kilograms of food a day. Five kilograms, think of that. For many people, that's almost a tenth of your body weight a day. Do you think you're going to get obese or fat? Well, none of you are. Of course, you're all slim in the audience. This is, uh, Moses always gets the fittest people here, so I mean, it's <laughs> useless to talk about disease to you because you're already fit. But um, to be truthful, um, that's a lot to eat, 10% of your body weight. But you get a lot of satisfaction. Think of all the family time you can spend together while you're chewing <laughs> your way through five kilograms of food a day. You see, so it's not a case of just stopping, picking it up, and driving off with it. It's a case of some serious thought around the dinner table and eating breakfast for two or three hours, lunch for <laughs> two or three hours, dinner for four hours, perhaps. You can see the bonding that takes place. <laughs> so, I mean, we, we've missed all that. But there's another thing that happens, which, is, which some people would, would say is very valuable. What else do you think happens when you take five kilograms of food in? A lot, of energy. A lot of energy, thank you. Anything else? <laughs> Somebody, somebody's doing this to me, thank you. Well done, yes. What goes in must come out. Um, so what do you think comes out of the other end? A lot. <laughs> so constipation, forget it. Brilliant. Three or so short, sharp movements a day. <laughs> what do you think the total weight was? Well, perhaps a better question is, how much do you normally put out a day? <laughs> if you can give it to me in pounds or grams. <laughs> do you put out sort of a quarter of a pound or 250 grams? Anyone doing more than 250 grams? <laughs> 300 grams, any takers? <laughs> ah, take for 300 grams, anyone? 400, 400, 400, five in my bid, five, five. So basically, um, I think there's a gentleman at the end there who's about 500 grams. But that really is, believe me, that is a record, that is a lot. Uh, normally, ladies put out about sort of 120, 150 on a good diet, and the gentleman, perhaps 200, 250. Gentlemen put out somewhat more than ladies. Not as you might think, just because they're full of it. But, <laughs> but, but in fact, because they eat more food because they require more calories. So you'll be pleased to hear that our, our Pope put out one kilogram of feces a day. Now, that wouldn't be such a dramatic thing if it wasn't for the fact that the fiber in the feces also binds some of the cholesterol products for the bodies, the pile acids, and it washes out your bile acids, which is one of the major ways your body loses cholesterol. So that's one of the major reasons that you lose cholesterol in these diets, because your body washes out the products of the cholesterol that don't get reabsorbed into the body, but get lost in the feces. So, that's the reason why that cholesterol, which could wind up in your arteries, winds up in the pan. So one of the va values of the diet. So that's just a, a sort of simple example. So it's interesting that um, in the United States and now in Canada, to some extent, uh, we are allowed to make health claims, uh, certainly for viscous fibers in Canada and plant sterols, uh, which you find in plant foods. Um, in the States, you can do it for vegetable proteins of soy and other legumes, for viscous fibers. Plant sterols, you can get in a plant sterol margarine, um, or in leafy vegetables and oils, um, and nuts. Uh, 
These have all been allowed to make health claims. So if there's a certain amount of these in the product, you can have a heart health claim. And you can for two of these in Canada. We're still catching up on the rest. But what I'm saying is we did the work before this came out, so it's interesting, it's gratifying to find that um, the agencies are now beginning to take up this particular message. So um, what's, what does this really mean? Well, it means that if, you, if you're on a healthy diet, you can lower your cholesterol by 10% by reducing the saturated and trans fats in your diet um, and putting in a dietary portfolio of sticky fibers from oats and barley and psyllium, some vegetable proteins from soy and other beans, peas and lentils, plant sterols from margarines, um, and nuts with almonds. That, if you added those up, as you can see, the 10 and the 5s would give you 30, which is what we see, and which is what you get with a cholesterol-lowering agent. Uh, so we think that diet really is being underutilized for this reason. Um, we were able to show uh, that you lowered serum cholesterol, LDL cholesterol. Um, if you did that, if you took a controlled diet, then if you took the same people, this is a four-week study now, all the food provided. This is our dietary portfolio, about 30%, and a statin, about 30% too. So we actually did the comparison in groups of people taking a statin or taking the diet. So they do work. Obviously, that's when everything's provided for you. What happens when you have to shop? Well, when you have to shop, uh, we did this for across Canada, um, in Quebec, Toronto, uh, Vancouver, and Winnipeg, 360 people who were either given intensive diet um, or not so intensive, it didn't matter. As long as they took the diet, they got about a 15% um, reduction shopping in the supermarket, buying the foods for themselves. So these are foods that you've got available. So we believe it's important. Um, we believe that uh, uh, you plant foods. Sorry, let me go back. Um, plant foods uh, uh, and plant food diets may control lipid risk factors for heart disease. And many small changes, if you make small changes, you eat some oats for oat bran for breakfast, you have some soy milk, you have some nuts, and you have fresh fruit and vegetables, you put these things together as a whole, then you've got what I call a portfolio. And those sort of things will make a dramatic difference in terms of cardiovascular risk, reducing both cholesterol and we now find blood pressure. So I really do encourage those things for use. And very recently, there was a study this last year um, called the Predimed study, where our, our colleagues in Spain just took two of the elements that we use, uh, the oil, the olive oil they took, and nuts. And they showed, looking at people over five years, 5,000 people, that the uh, rate at which they developed heart conditions was 50% lower than the control at the top um, just by taking these particular foods on the basis of a Mediterranean diet. So you really can make dramatic differences. These are the sort of differences we only see with drugs, this sort of difference at the bottom. So I do uh, advise those sort of things uh, for you. Something? Yes. So what are the implications what are we actually eating? And this is, that, that was the good news. Now the bad news. What is our agricultural system currently set to produce for you? Well, as many of you know, we're driving the small farmers off the land by big agribusiness. Um, and that's largely because we're demanding much cheaper prices for our food. Um, but to do that, we're having to develop a, a small number of crops which are actually supplying a growing meat industry. So we're not eating more plant foods, more vegetables. We're actually eating more meat as, as, a, as, as a global community. And if you look at the actual meat consumption, um, you can see that basically over the last 20 to 30 years, there's been a continuous rise in all countries this is the sort of North American picture you see in the blue. But then in the red, you can see China. 
And you're very lucky, you're very lucky that um, the religion has stopped India from taking the same path. It would be going in the same path too, which would mean colossal meat consumption on a planetary scale. But as I say, we're not doing that well either in terms of uh, plant food intake. So that's basically, we always have these pictures when you're in kindergarten of a cow in a field with a tree and the sun. Do you remember those? Did you ever draw those things? Anyway, well, you'll find those are in kindergarten. That is really what the children of today in kindergarten should be drawing because that's basically how we raise our cattle. Um, and this is the result. These are the large lagoons of basically um, fecal material that we have to wash out to keep these places clean. And they're antibiotic laden because we have to give our animals antibiotics because they're in such close conditions that they would not be able to survive and thrive well without antibiotics. That's where we get a lot of our resistant bacteria um, and that, that becomes a problem. So what one sees here is really a limited number of, sorry, um, what one sees is a limited number of crops of feeding into um, the, the sort of, uh, the, the hopper as it were, that supplies the animal produce below. And that's how, that, that's basically the way agriculture is going. And it's Western agriculture and it's, it's, it's taking over a global scale. We're become, even the agriculturists are becoming worried about it because about 14% of carbon emissions come from the meat industry. As that grows, that could be 30% or more. In other words, as we try and cut down on what we're using in terms of fossil fuel, we'll be using it for other reasons. We'll be using it for our agricultural production. So a major problem. Uh, if one turned to be a vegetarian, uh, not a vegan, a vegan would be better, you could cut a third from what is a non-vegetarian at the top. This is an estimate from the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition this last year, uh, suggesting what the, the carbon emissions are from different types of diet, non-vegetarian, semi-vegetarian, and vegetarian. So there are some, some compelling interests, I think, uh, that make one think that you can not only eat for your own health, but eat for environmental health at the same time. So everyone knows that fish is the health food. Is that right? Does anyone think that fish isn't a healthy food to eat? One hand. Thank you. Uh, but for the majority, thank you. For the majority, I think everyone will say fish is healthy. The bad news is that the recent studies that have come out has not shown that it has any particular advantage. It doesn't say it has a disadvantage. But the great advantage we thought for heart disease in randomized control trials has not worked out. However, we don't talk about that. Um, we just carry on with smoked salmon and trout almondine. Um, but there is a big problem, and that is that the fish catches have maxed out. We can't catch anymore. Really, from the 1950s right up to 2010, we've maxed out. And that's with a lot of new fishing abilities. We can't catch any more fish. The oceans, well, in Canada, we know the East Coast cod have gone. They haven't come back. So, I mean, we know. Um, but we're still trying to get them out of the sea. And it's estimated this is the disappearance of cod stocks. No, sorry, total fish stocks, total fish stocks, um, from the 1950 on to 2010. And by the time you get to 250, there will be no stocks in the sea. So what do we do? Farmed fish, is that the answer? So big problem. The farmed fish, have I spoken for too long? This, probably. The farmed fish require 2.5 to 5 kilograms of fish meal for one kilogram of farmed fish that you produce. Because they don't feed, they're carnivorous fish. So we have to feed them fish. So we actually have to still take fish out of the oceans, even for our farmed fish. Not only that, but there's the, sorry, there's the pollution. And if they're in the wild, the parasites, the parasites that they actually end up giving to the wild fish 
If you fish them in the oceans, if you fish them inland, then you've got water that's contaminated because they can't live for a long period in confined spaces of water while you're actually having to feed them antibiotics in the water. So again, we've got a problem in terms of if we go this way for nutrition. So in conclusion, my, uh, having, having depressed you all tremendously, <laughs> I'm sorry about that, but time is running out. Um, plant foods may have a major role in preventing chronic disease. The effects may be small individually. In other words, you buy something, you cook it, it's a small effect. You put it together as a total diet, you will get a major effect that can, in totality, if you put your total diet that way, um, have a drug-like effect. I'm obviously absolutely behind our past speaker, our last speaker, in saying that exercise, physical activity, is a key part of a healthy diet. Because if you can't exercise and expend energy, you can't take food in. So you do the two together. You keep yourself in good shape both ways by exercise and diet. And I think the, the sort of bottom line is a comprehensive strategy. So we want failure to direct humans towards plant foods. Plant food diets have major environmental and humanitarian consequences in the way we're treating other animals. And a concept, comprehensive strategy of dietary change, agricultural diversification, growing many types of crops, technological innovation as well, and serious global family planning because we can't really go past nine billion. That's going to be, that's going to be we're already li living on one and a half planets, um, are urgently required if we're not already too late to avoid that tipping plate point that scientists are always wor worrying and we're, we're warning us about. That, my friends, is the message. So I hope I've given you some good hope, but I think also reason to change. In other words, there's very good reason for you to link your own human health with environmental health, because that in, in turn is going to be the health of the generations to come, your children, your grandchildren, and their grandchildren. Thank you.